So TSM just came out with their most recent reality TV show episode, episode 28, Communication. And I want to take this opportunity again to analyze it from the sports psychology perspective, much like I did with some of the previous episodes with Team Liquid. So, um, where to start? I guess I'm going to begin with the the whole kind of like first quarter where we got to see a lot of the coaching communication and teammate communication between Dyrus and the rest of the squad. And Loco Doco again looks like every single other time I've ever seen him in any of the behind the scenes footage all the way back to Samsung Galaxy White when they faced them in World last year. Really good instinct as far as coaching style communication. He says things the right way, he hedges correctly, he directly confronts people in a way that forces them to respond but gives them a, uh, a way to define themselves in a positive manner. And um, obviously I think you know what I'm going to say about Reginald's style, it's quite horrible. Everything is basically stated as a you statement, so you are with the verb is conjugated in the present tense, and it's with very general predicates in the sentences. So you are this, you are that, you are this. He even says uh, at one point, even if you say that you aren't this, I know for a fact that, that that's not true. So this kind of narrative, basically, when you define somebody else's reality for them, is absolutely <laughs> toxic. Sorry, Thorne. Absolutely toxic in terms of mindset, in terms of self-identity, in terms of narrative growth, in terms of mental toughness. And it's absolutely unacceptable for any sort of coaching mindset. I don't think you will find any professional coach at any level using you statements and defining athletes as they are. Now, if you contrast that with what Lokodoko did, essentially he said you did. He did the past tense of action, so he's describing behaviors. And then he used specifics. You did these specific things, ergo, etc. So that's a much more open style of, of definition, allows the person to, instead of, um, okay, it's the difference between shame and guilt, right? So shame is the idea that, like, I am a bad person, and guilt is the idea of, like, I am a human, but I did a bad thing, or made a mistake, okay? So when you define somebody you are, you're, you're telling them what they are, okay? And people who have that definition about themselves, that self-identity, cannot change. Like, they are that person, right? But if you say that, I mean, if you come at somebody as a human and you describe actions and behaviors and consequences, people can have guilt towards that and then functionally change the way that they're acting without needing to do something drastic like change who they are. So an even better way to improve on both of these styles of communication is to use I statements. So instead of you did, you say, I think that... So it's coming from your perspective. It's always an opinion. I think that, plus observable behaviors, very similar to what Loco did, and therefore this problem. So I think that opinion, be, uh, observable behaviors, result in this problem. How can we solve this? And solicit from them, in an autonomous way, a solution to the problem so that they have to create the own, their own change. Okay. Second thing I want to talk about is moments of leadership. And by the way, I'm referring to my notes. So if I lose eye contact with you, I apologize. So there was two comments I wanted to get out here. Bjergsen says he kind of developed, went from this like authoritarian way of trying to talk to Dyrus to a very passive way, leading leadership. So like suggesting, hey, you might want to TP here, etc. And I actually think that's fantastic from a growth point of view. So first of all, Imagine the situation where Bjergsen is ordering Dyrus around very strictly, and Dyrus has to has a, has a very clear and easy option when that happens. He can just do the order, and very half-assedly, like kind of like follow through with it. And if he likes the thing, then then he can try to succeed at it. And if he doesn't like it, he might even subconsciously kind of like jeopardize it in a way, so that um, he has somebody to blame for the failure. And he always has somebody to blame for the failure because Bjergsen is the one ordering him around. So he can very easily like just do it, suck at it, fail at it, not take responsibility for it, and not improve and blame the situation. But Bjergsen was very passive about it, which meant that Dyrus had to take that moment of leadership. Dyrus had to be the one who made the call. He had to be the one who said, okay, this option is in front of me. I will take the moment of leadership and step up and take responsibility. 
that means he cannot escape the responsibility. And it actually was a problem for him because he didn't have a way of getting out of it and it really irked him. And that's what caused this all to bubble to the surface now. It's so much better that it happened now than later. Okay, conflict is not a bad thing in sport. And in this case, it was very good that this conflict happened because of Bjergsen's style of leadership, or at least Bjergsen's accidental style of leadership, how it evolved. Because when you force people to take responsibility for their moments of leadership in a game, then they have to grow enough to fill those shoes. And if they can't fill them, you want to know that before you go onto the world stage. Okay, now I want to move on to the next point, which was along the same theme, Santorin, talking about how he's getting pulled around by lanes. So this is not so great. Uh, this is his moment of leadership. Essentially, the kind of jungling that uh, I've seen out of Santorin and that I've seen kind of like in the behind-the-scenes communication is very much you know, at the beck and call of teammates instead of owning the early half of the game as his own and really taking charge of like what should be his domain. So I think that helping people to step up into those moments of leadership is uh, is probably a good, you know, task for our coaching staff. And I'm sure that there are many jungles and many teams where it functions to have somebody else kind of filling that role. But you have to realize that like at every moment in the game, the the person who is who is actually doing the action is the leader. So the person who is ganking, like choosing to come down and gank the lane, the person who is walking forward and putting the ward in the bush. It doesn't matter if Bjergsen says, go put that ward in the bush. The support player, Lust Boy, who's actually going forward and putting the ward in the bush is taking that moment of leadership. And so it's really crucial that people realize when the actions they take are leadership moments because then they can take responsibility for those moments and not blame other people like Santorin blaming the bottom lane for not ganking top. Okay, that's that's kind of ridiculous if you really think about it for a little bit, right? Okay, well, maybe you agree with me. Okay, number three. Uh, Dyrus says, little things put me on tilt. And he describes, you know, his struggles with handling, like, little things that kind of build up in, in his theme and in his narrative with that and how he kind of recovers, but then it always kind of builds up again. So this is a coaching mistake that I have harped on over and over and over again for the past year since I've been working in eSport. Well, actually, three years if you count all my complaining about it on my blog. But um, for some reason, eSport coaches focus 99% of the time on trying to fix mistakes and problems instead of building on successes. So this is what happens when you do that. When you coach mistake after mistake after mistake, what you end up is with this fixed mindset that is scared, tilty, and based on always having every little mistake pointed out. When you coach on success, when you coach on, on achievement and growth, what you end up with is this mentally tough mindset that will fail its way to mastery, fail its way to excellence in a very healthy and productive way. And the way that you do that is you promote what people are good at, you isolate that, you give people competence about their ability to improve on that skill over time, and you praise the effort that they put into making those changes, and you point out when that effort results in positive change. And that progression leads to a very sound championship mindset that leads to the pursuit of pursuit of mastery. So, I mean, this is this is basically like I would say a coach fi coaching failure in the long term. It's just it's just a lack of professionalization in, in coaching in terms of like knowing how to create a athletic mindset over the course of, of a span of year or season or two seasons, which is not really a problem. I mean, it's not really a fault of Loco or even Reggie because obviously they don't have training in coaching, but that doesn't mean they couldn't go seek it out and figure out how to do this kind of stuff. Okay, and finally, the group draw and the underdog mentality. So personally... I think that it's fantastic to get into the into Group D, particularly for TSM, and I'll explain why. Last year in Worlds, they did really good with the underdog mentality. I even wrote an article called Loco's Use of the Underdog Mentality, uh, where I highlighted his phrasing in the brief moments that I was able to hear You know the way that he was talking to his team during the Samsung Galaxy White Games, and his pick and ban and the way that the team played in general in those in those two or three games there. 
I see, I guess it would be four games because it was a best of five and they won one of them. So I think TSM does particularly well in an underdog mindset. I didn't think they do particularly horrible in a not underdog mindset. So essentially the idea here is like imagine that they didn't, that they got an easy group, okay? They would be doing what all North American teams do. Not all North American teams now. Obviously, CLG is perfect. But all North American teams have this mindset, this self-defeating mindset of, like, let's have a good showing, and then we're happy. We get to quarterfinals. We get out of groups. We get to semifinals. Maybe, oh, my God, we're so happy. They say they want to win the whole thing, but really they just want to get out of groups. Nobody strives like they want to win the whole thing. So... What happens if you get an easy group is it's very difficult to ramp up your motivation and focus in the way that would be necessary to win the entire world championship. Yes, you might, if you get into an easy group, be able to ramp up your focus and your motivation to get out of the group and make it to maybe quarters or semis. But people have this self-defeating attitude of like, oh, well, that's about as far as we're going to make it. And we'll just see how it goes there. We'll just do our best and kind of see how it goes, which basically means... They don't care if they win or not. Um, but when you're in an underdog mentality in the group itself, you have to work your butt off just to even get out of the group. That means you're going to come in in top form. That means you might actually have a chance of making it to the finals and winning the whole thing. So in terms of training atmosphere, this is one of the best situations you can be in. Now, CL, that doesn't mean that CLG is at a disadvantage uh, because they got an what could be perceived of as an easier group. What it means is that in order to have the same basic operating like level of, of stress and pressure that TSM is under, CLG has to have more mental fortitude and more mental focus to extend their uh, that pressure into themselves artificially rather than relying on the environment to create it. And that is something that highly capable athletes are are good at doing and that is something that highly capable coaches are good at doing so i don't have any fear over that not happening but i'm really excited that tsm kind of ended up with a group like this because from what i see from the video it's going to produce out of them like a pretty stellar performance compared to what it could have been and that is the end of my video check out my youtube channel i had do a, one of these every single day so I'm producing, most of them are training focused. When something like this comes up, obviously I, I like to talk about current events. And some of them I even have handouts and whatnot that you can do to learn how to train your eSport skill. Try to pursue mastery in eSport and uh, play at a really high level. Thanks again, and I'll see you tomorrow.